Online has since amended the headline of its report on the matter but maintains that it stands by its story. Members of Parliament call for amendment of Disability Act to conform to international standards. One Municipal Assembly embarks on demolition of structures in the congestion of business districts. Chief Executive of Tobinko on a 2 million CD bill after his arrest. But his company has described his detention at the Nima police station as unfair. A Ghana to launch giant telescope as part of efforts to boost space science and technology research. We also have business for showbiz and international news all coming up. News at eight with Israel Lai. Now, in our very first story, government has described as inaccurate reports that President John Mahama intervened to stop payments of debt owed Merchant Bank by engineers and planets, a company owned by his brother. Describing the report as inaccurate and erroneous, Deputy Information and Media Relations Minister Felix Kwachio Fusu accused Joy FM of, of shifting from the earlier reports to cite conflict of interest. According to the Deputy Minister, there is no case of conflict of interest since the late President Mills was the one petitioned and not President John Mahama. He said it's important that the media house clarifies the issues and apologize. From the Flagstaff House, here's Gifty and our peers reports. Briefing from here at the Flagstaff House today is basically about expansion works that's about to begin at the Takra Report tomorrow. Uh, it is a uh, 197 million euro project which is aimed at ensuring that the port is expanded and equipped to safely taking modern, bigger and deep drafted vessels. Uh, it's also aimed at ensuring a quick turnaround time for ships in order to cut down on the amount of time that is spent uh, working on one ship. Uh, Parliament approved of a loan agreement between the government of Ghana and Constratura Quitos Gaval Essay of Brazil uh, to the tune of $100 million for the design and construction of the Tamale International Airport airfield and pavement. Uh, currently, there is one going at the Kutuka International Airport, a major rehabilitation project termed the Kutuka International Airport Phase 3 rehabilitation project. But the dicey issue of reports that the president may have been involved in a transaction between Merchant Bank and E&P, a company belonging to his brother, was not left out of the discussion. There was absolutely no point where there was any uh, intervention from the presidency to stop Merchant Bank or any other organization for that matter from carrying out its mandates of pursuing any entities that owed it. The headline sought to create a different impression from what actually existed. I don't believe that we need to shift onto tangential matters as a way of covering up for what is clearly a, a, an erroneous report. Again, I don't see what conflict of interest situation arises. If an entity feels aggrieved and petitions the president at the time, Professor John Ivanzata Mills, where does a conflict of interest situation arise? So you cannot discriminate on the basis of familiar relationships. The news organizations that put that out owe it to themselves. The ethics of their profession requires that they do the right and render the necessary apologies. In the opinion of the Deputy Information and Media Relations Minister, journalistic ethics were flouted in the report, citing misleading headlines, which he says should be apologized for. For him, the issue is more about journalistic professionalism rather than conflict of interest at the presidency. Gifty Andopia, Joy News, Flagstaff House. Well, my joint line has since amended the headline in the report that the presidency complained about and put out the following statement. It has come to our notice that the headline on our story of December 2, 2013, presidency stopped Merchant Bank from recovering debts from company owned by president's brother was not exactly accurate. To the extent that the headline did not reflect the contents and import of our story, we deeply regret any inconvenience the headline might have caused to the president and false imputations it may have conveyed. We have taken steps to amend the headline to align perfectly with the body of the story.
All right, the presidency had earlier issued a statement responding to the same publication, which statement, however, did not deny the claims by Joy FM. That statement is as follows. The attention of the Office of the President has been drawn to news broadcast by Joy FM and subsequent online publication by My Joy Online, accusing the presidency of intervening to prevent the payment of a debt owed Merchant Bank Ghana by Messiers Engineers and Planners. We wish to draw the attention of Joy FM and My Joy Online that it is not unusual for the presidency to receive petitions from private companies or individuals who feel unfairly treated by one government agency or another. In such cases, as was rightly done by the then Secretary to the President, J.K. Bebakomenta, the petition by engineers and planners was forwarded to Merchant Bank to furnish the presidency with information on the issues raised in the petition. We wish to state for emphasis that President John Mahama has never, during his days as Vice President and now as President, intervened or directed the Merchant Bank not to recover its debts or vary the terms of debts owed it by engineers and planners or any other organization or individuals indebted to the bank. And here again, I must state that Joy FM, and in fact, when Evans Mr. joined me here on the bulletin last night, did not say that the president directed Merchant Bank not to recover its debts. The statement concludes as follows. Indeed, government believes the Merchant Bank and all other banks in which the state has an interest must adopt every legitimate means, including legal action, to recover debt owed them by companies and other individuals. Meanwhile, in the, on the, the very latest on the uh, issue is that the Executive Director of the Center for Freedom and Accuracy, Andrea Wooney, has instructed his solicitors to discontinue his suit against the sale of Merchant Bank to private equity fund Fortes at the Fast Track High Court. Rather, he has brought a new suit, this time at the Commercial Division of the High Court, where, according to his lawyer, Egbert Fable, he is now seeking relief against 13 persons, including Merchant Bank, Social Security and National Insurance Trust, Bank of Ghana, Fortes, and KPMG. Other former directors of the Merchant Bank Board have also been named in the suit. The center was praying the court to abrogate the transaction, which will be giving away 90% shares of the bank at 90 million Ghana cities to Fortis. It also prayed the court to place an injunction on the deal it claimed was not giving the country value for money. The case was adjourned to December 5, 2013, after it was a called on in court on Thursday, November 28, 2013. It doesn't appear, however, that uh, the Thursday sitting is going to come on. In other news, Head of Regulatory Affairs at Tobingo Pharmaceuticals, Bernard Boating, has described as unfair the detention of the company's CEO Monday night at the Nima police station. Samuel Amutobing was released on a 2 million Ghana city bill after some hours in detention. The head of regulatory affairs at Tobinko, Bernard Boatin, says the CEO voluntarily reported to UECO with his lawyer to discuss the ensuing impasse um between the company and the FDA, only to be confronted with accusations that he incited staff to obstruct the work of UECO. The offense is being linked to a standoff between the FDA and Tobinko workers at one of their warehouses about two weeks ago. Bernard Boatin, however, denies the claims. What really happened was two weeks ago, we had officials from Yoko and FDA joint team coming to a manufacturing facility that belongs to Mr. Tobin but does not bear the name Tobinko. So the management of that facility decided to question why would you come here? We understand, yes, you have issues with Tobinko, you have some things that you are discussing, but where we are now is not Tobinko. And so you will do us good if you at least give us a search warrant or a court order that instructs you to come to this premises, which we thought was fair. And all that while Mr. Tobin was not in the facility. So it really, if we say that the offense is obstruction of duty, then it becomes a little questionable because indeed the duty that he was supposed to perform that day was performed. So where does the obstruction of duty come in? According to him, the action by Yoko was simply witch hunting. We have made it clear in our press conference that if some individuals have openly 
told Mr. Tobin that I will finish you, I will bring you down like I did to Semencia and all that. Then what is happening is like a fulfillment of that promise or that threat. And so you, you will see that indeed what is happening is just clear acts of harassment and victimization for which we see that it is not necessary at all. Because if the issue happened two weeks ago, the question that will be on everybody's mind is why do you want to arrest the person only yesterday for that offense only? The Parliamentary Select Committee on Health, who have already waded in the controversy, have asked the company not to engage the FDA and UECO in any media war while they resolve the matter. Government is set to launch a 32-meter telescope soon as part of efforts to build the country's space science and technology industry. Minister for Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, Joe Tingeje, who made this known at the 5th African Leadership Conference in Accra, emphasized that the project will positively impact the country's agricultural, telecommunication and mining sectors, amongst others. The conference brought together scientists, research professionals and political leaders across Africa to deliberate on the state of space science and technology in Africa and how to move it forward. The continent, as part of efforts to improve its capabilities in space science and technology, have committed to the multi-billion dollar square array radio telescope project under the leadership of South Africa. The SKA project will improve African capability in space science, technology and innovation. The, the enormous benefits in infrastructure will contribute immensely to the economic growth of Africa. It will create jobs for thousands of African youth. It will also make it possible for African scientists with their counterpart elsewhere to answer some of the basic questions in astrophysics. Among the eight countries interested in undertaking the telescope project, Ghana won the bid and has received a $2 million grant to build a 32-meter telescope. The telescope, which is to be launched soon, is expected to impact on the economy greatly. Those of us in environment, we are looking for using it to see Galamse people and taking images of those who are doing it. I don't have to be there, but the technology will allow me to take the images. Once I get to an image, I'll be able to follow up and allow the laws to apply. In the areas of disaster, we, when, if something happens, depending on the use of your mobile, you should be able to relay it to the, to the appropriate place within the shortest of time. And those are the areas, both in the health, agri, monitoring of environmental things, national security, borders. People are smuggling cocoa, they are smuggling fuel. These days, with that technology, we should be able to see you crossing and use that to, to prevent and, and ensure that we sustain the economy. The Ghana Space Science and Technology Institute established recently is leading in the telescope project and is building capacity of Ghanaians to man it. Meanwhile, a communique will be issued after the three-day conference on how Africa can develop space science policies, build capacity and build a shared vision for the sector. The Western Region Police Command has arrested three armed robbers accused of robbing a gold leader at Bamiyanko in the Inzema East District of the region. The robbers are said to have made away with ver various items, including cash and pellets of gold. A report by Western Regional Correspondent William Benjamin Peters. According to the Western Regional Crime Officer, Chief Superintendent James Kofi Abraham, the victim, 26-year-old Anthony Boa, who is a gold dealer at Bamiyanko, on November 29, reported to the Dominasi police that he had been attacked by James Boa Bafo, 22, and Bruku Sutiame, 23, upon his return from buying gold at a Galamse site near Dominasi. He said the two robbers attacked Anthony with a sharp sword shaped in the form of a walking stick and made away with the seven pellets of raw gold, a gold weighing scale, a calculator, his Nokia mobile phone, and an amount of 2,000 Ghana cities. The regional crime officer said the police, based on the description of the suspects, managed to retrieve the names of two of the suspects from leaders at the Galamse site where the robbery took place. The two suspects then led the police to the heart of their accomplice, suspect Jijonya Jaffo, 
2018, where four pellets of raw gold were retrieved. Yeah, of course, we are still investigating, but they are all confessed, and they are saying that this is their first time of being caught. But it's their first time of being caught, so that doesn't mean that maybe the previous, they haven't done it, only that they were not caught. The Western Regional Police Commander, DCO Pico Fibuache, highlighted several other arrests, including those involved in the Mansoa Menfi robbery incident. He said the police intend to deploy about 150 officers in the region to embark on snap checks and traffic enforcement this year tight and appealed to the public to bear with them for any inconvenience they may suffer. I think this year has been very, very, very good. Don't forget that the strategy of visibility visibility as an accessibility has reduced crime tremendously. Crimes which hitherto will have been committed in the absence of police are not being committed again. Therefore, if you look at that direction, and even if you come to robberies, this year, I think the robbery, level of robberies has reduced by about 50% on the Takwa, uh, Bogosu Highway, uh, Pristia, uh, Asante Grand Mansour and Fee, and Samar Boy Road. I think it was where it was higher last year, but this year it has come down partly because of the logistics availability, the number of men, and also. And we have more stories coming up after the break, teacher. Now, disability has remained largely invisible in the mainstream development agenda of various governments. Though there have been efforts to promote the rights of persons with disabilities, many still face neglect and do not have equal opportunities like their abled counterparts. As the world marks the International Day for Persons with Disability today, Yafo Sajenfi asks what efforts are being put in place to implement the Disability Act. December 3 is celebrated every year as the International Day for Persons with Disability. The commemoration of this year's Disability Day provides an opportunity to further raise awareness about the challenge of disability and to help promote the removal of all forms of barriers against disabled persons. The day is also to assist disabled persons realize their full potential and contribute their quota to national development. Over 1 billion people, approximately 15% of the world's population, population live with some form of disability or the other. Around the world, persons with disabilities face physical, social, economic and attitudinal barriers that exclude them from participating fully and effectively as equal members of society. Disabled persons are marginalized in one way or the other in assessing education. Most schools do not have decks specifically designed for wheelchair users and access to washrooms is totally not disability friendly. Transportation for these persons are also serious challenges and to top it up, they are highly discriminated against when it comes to access to basic resources, employment and health care. Sylvia Pippa is a disabled person at a senior high technical school for the deaf. She lost both her sight and hearing at the age of eight. But with the help of her tutors, Sylvia can now read and write and wants to set up a foundation for persons with both hearing and sight impairment. Education. Education is the thing. Education is the thing that helps us. Education is the thing. Persons living with disability can have equal access to life only if the Disability Act passed in 2007 will be implemented. At the moment, it is largely ignored with almost 90% of public institutions and buildings without disability-friendly passageways. The 2010 census in Ghana estimates that as much as 20% of Ghanaians are disabled. Such a huge number can definitely not be ignored as their contribution could significantly impact the country's development.
Well, members of parliament have called for the Disability Act to be amended to conform to international standards. The members also called for attitudinal change to offer opportunities for persons with disabilities so they can also contribute to development in the quest to making disability visible in their development process. The Disability Act, passed by Parliament in 2006, Act 715, deals with the rights of persons with disability in all aspects of life. After the passage, provisions were made with respect to public buildings to make it disability friendly. The MP for Subin, Isaac Osei, however, called on the House to help strengthen the Disability Act, which he says is currently inconsistent with the UN Convention. Time, Mr. Speaker. As we celebrate the 21st anniversary of the observance of the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, to work together as a nation, to break the economic, sociocultural, attitudinal, and physical barriers in our homes and families, in classrooms, in workplaces, and on the streets of our towns and cities, and assist in making disability visible. MP for Krachi in Chumuru, John Majisi, suggested Public office holders be given orientation and training to draft more persons with disability into public service. The member for Tano North, Frida Prempe, was concerned Parliament as an institution has failed to promote disability-friendly structures, even though the Speaker disagreed. It's not uh, no fault of theirs that they found themselves in that situation. But Mr. Speaker, what do we see? Our own institutions, who is supposed to implement and enforce the law, the media are doing their best, but I think they still have a lot of room to improve on what they are doing for our sisters with disability. I've just, been, I've let, just been informed. Mr. Director, how do they get inside here, Mr. Speaker? I've just been informed, please. please. Mr. Speaker, the, the Federation is only waiting for the 10 years to elapse, and they will take some institutions on. I believe they are waiting for... I remember I conclude. Mr. Speaker, thank you. <laughs> A member of the disability group who was a playmate of Michael Essien and now the captain of the national amputee team was hopeful members will now champion their cause. It was feeling so great. I'm so much grateful. Uh, first time me appear before them. Even my um, statement, my small story of mine and my name appear in, pre in present them. I'm so much grateful. And now that uh, they have started championing our cause. We believe that uh, two, three years to come, a uh, disability issue will be well as well. Earlier in the day, the Palestinian ambassador to Ghana paid a courtesy call on the speaker in a bid to strengthen the relationship between the two countries. The speaker, in response, assured the ambassador of Ghana's continued support. The state of Palestine is legitimate cause which must be established living side by side the state of Israel. And it's a very simple straight position that Ghana has consistently taken from independence up to today. Sitting resumes tomorrow. Now, technological abuse has been identified as an emerging form of violence against women and children in the country. The increasing rate of sexual and gender-based violence against women, particularly in social media circles, according to stakeholders, has created a situation where many young women who otherwise could have risen to their full potential become ostracized by society. are said to have been subjected to physical, emotional and verbal abuse in their lifetime. The traditional forms have usually been harmful customs such as child-enforced marriages and female genital mutilation and others who out of jealousy on the part of their male partners and romantic relationships that have gone sour have had acid poured on them, slashed with machetes and beaten to the pulp. But experts say technology is also permitting new ways of sexual violence and exploitation against women and girls. According to these experts, Women are usually out of love, persuaded by their partners to pose nude for photographs, only to find such photographs on the internet. On the occasion of the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, women are therefore cautioned to be wary of partners who exhibit abusive tendencies. We should watch those who say they love us, and especially for young ladies, it is good to act. If you say you love a person and the person has disappointed you, does it mean pouring acid on that person or beating her to pulp? 
Does it even justify picking a sharpened machete to reduce the lady to pieces? Or does it even justify picking a gun and shooting the woman? Unfortunately, this is another emerging trend. So we ask, where is the love? Ghana has joined other countries worldwide to mark the 16-day campaign to end violence against women and girls. The goal of this year's celebration is to involve men and boys in the prevention of gender-based violence in the country. Mothers, we have a role to educate our sons, our husbands and our partners against gender-based violence and train our boys in a way that when they grow up, they will not beat their wives and they'll treat women with respect and the Ashama men led by their MCE Honorable Ibrahim Beidou has said no to gender-based violence and we want this to echo throughout Ghana other stakeholders including the United Nations Population Fund and the Netherlands Embassy pledged their support in the fight against the elimination of all forms of violence against women in the country Time now for some business reports with me, Abigail Adumakwenchi. Now, the Volta River Authority has put on hold plans to issue a $500 million bond in January next year. The state power generator in September secured approval from its board to go to the international market and raise the funds for its power generation project and would have become the first utility provider in the country to go this way. Had they gone ahead? The new chief executive, Kerr Kofi, explains to Joy Business the plan has been suspended, having been convinced that gas supplies for electricity generation will significantly improve. He also mentions arrangements with independent power producers uh, uh, to add significantly uh, to the authorities' books before it goes out to the bond market. London based Economist Intelligence Unit had warned that BRA's bond issue would face some challenges because of continued underpricing of electricity in the country. Now away from that to the floor of Parliament on the budget, the debate on the 2014 budget continued with members from the minority largely attacking it while the majority defended it. Uh, here are excerpts of today's debate. This hard woman that in the budget of 2014, at least 100 medium to large scale poultry uh, farms will be grown and given inputs in the form of maize and soybean so that up to 30,000 metric tons of meat, poultry meat will be produced uh, in 2014. A cheap compound, to build a cheap compound is 1,312 Ghana cities, 50 pesos. Incredible! It is incredible, Mr. Speaker, when the same minister told us last year that they will build 405 chill compounds and they delivered only 19. 19. And 25 are on development. Mr. Speaker, this is a propaganda based budget. My colleague is a member of the Health Committee. So, for anything but even the Health, uh, the health Ministry's budget, he's just been giving the estimates. And, Mr. Speaker, I challenge him, he should look through. All the programs have been costed and properly aligned in the estimate. He knows that the main budget itself cannot have the detail. He is a senior member of this house. He knows that the main budget will not have all the detail. But he's just been giving the estimate for the ministry where all the programs are clearly spelled out with their costing. So why is he misleading this house saying that all the program is just the same as what has been happening and no costing and programs are not properly aligned. I'm making a categorical statement of facts. Thank you, sir. To say that the information is there. Fortunately, you are a member. We will also have another opportunity at the estimate stage to look at this data. But he says that it is in that document. He says that Thank the you. Thank you, Mr. Is there. Speaker. So let's move Mr. on. Mr. Speaker, let's, let's, I, let's, why, let's make progress. That is why I accepted this statement in an honorable gesture. Mr. Speaker, we are talking about program based budgeting. I'm not talking about experts submitted to committees. Inclusive in the Mr. Speaker, I have in my hand a program based budget of South Africa and a program based budget. He is saying that whatever program you mentioned above, you mentioned five programs, and he is saying that whatever program there is in the estimate has been costed. But you made a specific 
statement that the pro none of the programs have been costed. He is saying that in the estimate is that been costed. You have made your point, he has made a point. When we come to consider the details, we will take that matter further. Well, so more debates on the budget and Joy Business will be bringing you up to speed with the issues as and when they happen. Away from that, the one municipal assembly has embarked on a decongestion exercise to free up its business district properties where several thousands of Ghana cities, including the former Wa International School, were demolished in the exercise to allow a relocation of the main bus terminal currently at Wa Kedetia. Rafiq Salam's report from Wa. <laughs> The Wa Kajitia bus terminal is packed with human beings and container shops which are competing for space with the vehicles. The congestion has created a favorable atmosphere for thieves to operate while pedestrians are often knocked down by vehicles. In a bid to free up the bus terminal, the Wa Municipal Assembly decided to demolish the former Wa International School and other structures close to it to create space for the relocation of the terminal. Armed with a rented bulldozer, the Assembly's tax force reduced the school and other shops to rubble as the helpless owners looked on. This man, who identified himself as Imori Tivena, accused the Assembly of not consulting them before embarking on the exercise. You are not aware. They didn't tell the landlords. And the place to do is not for government land. Yes, we are not aware. Nobody is aware of it. Those who put their contents to do, they are not aware. We, we, are, we will agree. Of course, that the contents that is along with the road, they have to remove all. If not, we will agree. We have to take it. We will leave it here. We will leave the matter here. We are going to send it beyond all our, our, all our control. So we will leave it here. Although he says he supports the Assembly's decision to decongest the area, the affected persons may resort to legal action since the Assembly has been partial in its approach. Meanwhile, the Municipal Chief Executive for WA, Isaku Nuhu Putiaha, has defended the Assembly's action, arguing they have done no wrong. In fact, that particular structure that we are pulling down, is so dilapidated, it hasn't been in use. What we have to say is that some people were illegally using it as a school. There were, it was also a hub for criminals to, 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 to do their nefarious activities, especially in the night, and it has not been used. Though an assembled property, it was idling for a very long time. So that structure, in actual fact, was not used legally by any other person. He appealed to residents to support the assembly achieve its mandate of bettering the lives of the people. Rafiq Salam's report from WA. Now, President John Mahama has urged farmers to adopt modern ways of farming to make the most of farmland. He has also announced an outright 70% payment by farmers for government subsidized tractors. The president was addressing this year's Best Farmer Award winners ahead of the National Farmers Day. Let's take a listen. In many countries, some of the richest people are farmers. And it must be the same in Ghana that the richest people in this country must not be contractors, must not be uh, other engineers or other people, it must be farmers. Because everybody eats food. You can quarrel with your wife, you can quarrel with your friend, you can quarrel with anybody, but you can't quarrel with food. <laughs> and so every day, people eat food. And who produce the food is the farmers. And so that should translate into money into the pockets of people who are willing to take farming as a business. And the uh, media uh, should lead that way to change the perception of farmers that they are poor. We will continue the policy of providing improved seeds and other incentives to farmers in order to increase their production. We have a, pro a program to provide subsidized tractors to farmers. And there, I must say, um, we are having a bit of problem. Uh, government absorbs 30% of the price of the tractor and the farmer is supposed to take the tractor and pay the remaining 70% over a three-year period. Unfortunately, those 
who have received the tractors have been very reluctant to pay for the tractors. This was supposed to be a revolving facility so that we could extend it to other farmers. But because the pioneers who received those tractors are reluctant to pay, it is making it difficult for government to continue to turn this uh, project around. And so I wish to appeal to the farmers that if we are to reintroduce the issue of subsidized tractors, they must endeavor to pay for the tractors. Right now, what we're doing with the tractors that are coming is that government still subsidizes by 30%, but you are required to pay the 70% in a lump sum before you take the tractor because of those who have refused to pay in the past. Well, that's it for business. I'm Abigail Aduma Quenchi. Sports comes up shortly. Right, news making rounds in the world of sports. Time to find out exactly what's top of that agenda. And Ghana will be in part two with fellow African countries Nigeria, Algeria, Cote d'Ivoire and Cameroon ahead of the 2014 FIFA World Cup this Friday. FIFA this afternoon announced the ports to be used for next year's World Cup finals uh, when all the 32 teams will actually look for a place in the first round of their competition. A pre-draw will be held to move one of the nine European teams in part two. And I can quickly run you through the entire you know, port, porting system and find out what's looking. Let's first of all start with uh, Port 1. And Port 1 has the strongest groups, definitely, in that one. Pair the ranking, according to the FIFA ranking. We have Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Uruguay, Spain, there's Germany, there's Belgium, as well as Switzerland. We get into Port 2. We have Algeria, Cameroon, uh, we have Chile, we have Ivory Coast, Ecuador, Ghana, and Nigeria. So you understand that in this particular group, you have only seven uh, teams here. That's why one of the groups will be coming out of Port 4 to join in in, uh, actually joined Port 2 in that uh, pre-draw. Now we get into Port 3, we have Australia, Costa Rica, Honduras, Iran, Japan, South Korea, Mexico, and USA. And in Port 4, you have Bosnia, Croatia, England, France, Greece, Italy, Netherlands, all in that particular out in Portugal. So you understand that they have nine European teams, and there is a particular rule that says that not you know, more than two European countries can be in a particular group. That is one that is going to be observed, and that's the reason why uh, there's going to be a pre-draw to get one of the teams in the final port into port two. So it's still looking very, very strong anyway you look at it, actually. We just keep on praying and find out what happens. Some two days to get into that. Now, Ghana will receive the Queen's Baton Relay in January next year ahead of the Commonwealth Games in Scotland after the official launch of the traditional curtain razor at the British Council this afternoon. The baton will officially be unveiled at the Flagstaff House where President John Mahama will usher the tour which will rope in the Minister of Youth and Sports and the GLC President. We will hear from the British High Commissioner, His Excellency Peter Jones in a bit. First though, we are going to be hearing from the Deputy Sports Minister, Joseph Yamin. Confidence that Ghana Olympics Committee will be bringing a lot of medals. I mean, I believe strongly that we are going to win uh, one of our highest, uh, I mean, medals ever in any competition. Looking at the the teams we have and the the competitions and medals that the athletes are winning. I mean, we now have potentials in swimming. We have potentials in badminton. Potentials in weightlifting. We have potentials in almost every uh, discipline that uh, we'll be competing in. And so if we say that we are not competing in the Olympics, I'm sure that the Olympics will not allow us and will not be, be happy with me at all. Let us open up, let the game start, and Ghana goes up there to prove a point to the whole world that we're not only doing well in football, but uh, we are going to prove a point uh, in other disciplines. One little thing to note about the dates. That means the Commonwealth Games are immediately after the Football World Cup in Brazil. So you will be able to watch the Black Stars play England in the World Cup final in Rio and still have time to go to Glasgow. I won't predict the result, but I look forward to a good game. So once again, following the Olympics and the Paralympics, we will see some of the world's finest athletes and sports people coming and competing in the United Kingdom. And I'm delighted that Ghana, a proud member of the Commonwealth with a proud sporting history, will be there too. 
Right, now Ghana will hold the qualifiers for the biggest amateur football championship in the world between January and March next year. The five-a-side tournament, which aims at unearthing amateur undiscovered talents to be showcased in the final event in Dubai in May 2014. It's an interesting one we'll be looking ahead to. And Charles Hobe is a member of the local organizing committee, and he has been speaking to Joy Sports about this new tournament. So that's what the F5WC is all about. It's the biggest world amateur football championship coming up. And it will be coming up in Dubai next year. Um, it's called um, Dubai 2014. And um, the idea is to discover players who haven't gotten the opportunity to have to play professional and give them a platform to to be able to exhibit their skills who knows what it might take them far because um it's a tournament specifically organized by the dubai government it's considering that very soon the world cup is going to asia they are creating a lot of awareness about and increasing their awareness about football considering the, the original plan for this program and um and the people involved in it i think it's it, it gave us it, it gave us the idea that they are serious about this and the whole program right from the scratch you could see that it's the the qualifying teams will not even have are going to have a fully expense trip all right so that'll be all for sports tonight my name is george Ade jr israel i will join us with some more news then you have a good night sports was brought to you in as veteran high life musician alfred benjamin krenzel who was or A.B. Krenzel, who was recently honored at the 2013 Legends Legacy Bowl, has been sharing the secret to his long stay in music with uh, showbiz. In an interview after a tribute concert held in Izana, the 69-year-old says focus and hard work have been his cardinal points throughout his career. veteran Alfred Benjamin Krenzel, popularly known as A.B. Krenzel, was honored this past weekend at a tribute concert, a Legends and Legacy Ball, for his contribution to the growth and development of the Ghanaian music industry. Honoring you as a high life professor, you're made of more and you're truly a living music legend. A.B. Krenzel, I call you. Later in an interview with Showbiz, A.B. Krenzel urged budding musicians to take their craft seriously if they are to succeed in the music industry. You don't have to fool around with <laughs> whatever is your aim, you see, whatever you're doing. Everybody must try his best to do what he's supposed to do, you know, like music. Okay, music, uh, uh, they can take up music, but they have to do it well. You know, to, to attract uh, the, uh, the, the, the people, yes. Otherwise, uh, you are fighting a, a lose battle. Meanwhile, contemporary high-life musician Kosi P, who has been inactive in the industry, says even though the younger generation of musicians have the passion to do music, there are challenges in the industry preventing musicians like himself from realizing their full potentials. I've been around, you know, working and all that, is, but it's just, you know, uh, the system is not too good, it's not actually favoring us. But then we hope things will change in the near future so that we can um, show at the end of the day the talent we have and the good songs, you know, we, we, we're producing, yeah. How well, for now, one can only hope the Musicians Union of Ghana will be able to help its members overcome their hurdles to keep music alive in the country. <laughs> And that's all for showbiz. Now, that's it for the bulletin. Before we go, the quick run through our top stories. Government demands apology over reports suggesting President John Mahama stopped Merchant Bank from recovering debt audit by engineers and planners, a company owned by his brother. My Joy Online has since amended the headline of its report on the matter but maintains that it stands by its story. Members of Parliament call for amendment of Disability Act to conform to international standards. While Municipal Assembly embarks on demolition of structures in the congestion of business districts. 
Chief Executive of Tobinko on a 2 million Ghana CD bill after his arrest, but his company has described his detention at the Nima police station as unfair. And Ghana to launch Giant Telescope as part of efforts to boost space science and technology research. That's it. For more news, log on to myjoyonline.com.